everyone. Welcome to the next episode of Bones and Stones. In today's session, we're going to learn about something that at the moment is very topical around the globe. It is a tr it is tragic that in, in 2020, these issues persist, which are rooted in a very long history of colonialism and oppression. And when teaching these histories, it often strikes me that many people aren't aware of the devastating and traumatic impact colonialism had on local communities. People don't know about the extermination of hunter-gatherers who were seen as vermin and thieves and shot for little reason at all, if any. Uh, the hanging tree near Bulawayo where people res who resisted Bizak rule, which was the British South African company, were hanged. Or the atrocious and hellish rule of Leopold II, a king in Belgium, at the same time as the uh, sovereign of the then Congo Free State, where he committed crimes against humanity that will shake you to your core. The call to remove statues of people who committed these crimes and place them in museums where they can be contextualized should hardly be a discussion. And yet here we are with people defending these figures and by doing so overlooking or underestimating the terrible impact their collective actions had on global communities. Colonists often held, perpetuated and embellished fairly terrible denigratory views of indigenous communities and even used archeology span and history to suit their own land grabbing agenda, which we discussed in an earlier episode. These views have influenced the way we understand archeological traces both the White Lady of the Brunberg, the rock art site and in Namibia, and Great Zimbabwe were linked to foreign visitors and developers. It was, to scholars in the early and even mid 20th century, inconceivable that local groups could produce something of the kind. Unfortunately, though, these perceptions are not mute. Some views still argue that pre-colonial Indian communities came here to source precious metals and interbred with the local hunter-gatherer community to produce the koi a point emphatically disproven with archeology, span genetics, and linguistic history. Then there are the people who believe that stone walled structures were not lived in, but are rather portals to other parts of the universe and date to 200,000 years ago. What these so-called histories do is strip indigenous communities of their heritage. People who propagate these ideas refuse to acknowledge local innovation, development, and agency. The impact of colonialism, which included the devaluing of local histories, heritage, and traditions, are ever so alive in these kinds of beliefs and present society. Today, we're gonna to unpack one aspect of the colonial impact on South Africa's shores and something people are often unaware of, slavery. To talk about this and teach us a little bit about slavery's history is Linda Mbeki, a postdoc from the University of Pretoria. Hi, Linda, thanks very much for coming on um, and uh, talking to us about this really important is issue and a, and a history that so many of us are unaware of or don't know the intricacies. Perhaps to begin, would it be possible for you just to give us a bit of background in terms of your research and what you've been looking at with regards to slavery in South Africa? Okay, thanks for having me. Um, I am sharing my time between UP and Ezekiel Museums in Cape Town. So okay. I, should, uh, I should make that clear. <laughs> sure, thanks. So I can earn my keep. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, so, I have to be honest that I myself was also quite ignorant about uh, slavery in South Africa. And it was really just a, a keen interest to catch up and to know about this aspect of my own history as a South African uh, that, uh, that got me uh, started on this research. And um, to describe slavery a little bit in Cape Town, um, so at the beginning of the colony, after uh, Jan van Riebeck arrived and, uh, and contrary to popular belief, he didn't find a vacant land, he found uh, indigenous people, but uh, he, his task was to set up a, a way station there. And, um, and he couldn't incentivize his own workers. And of course the indigenous people were, they belonged to independent uh, societies and they were at the time quite, uh, quite strong. Their communities were quite strong. So, and on top of that, the, the Dutch East India Company didn't uh, encourage the enslavement of indigenous populations. So he wrote desperately to his bosses um, to say, you know, we need to build all these fortifications. We need to do this, that, and the other, send us slaves. Uh, in fact, he suggested enslaving the indigenous population, which he didn't get support for, but uh, he, did, he did receive um, shipments of enslaved people initially from 
the, the Atlantic world, but subsequent to that, all, uh, all enslaved people came from the Indian Ocean world, which is where the Dutch East India Company had its uh, empire, uh, its seaborne empire. And uh, so from Robert Shell's work, and uh, which was quite a few years ago, but uh, also from um, Warden's work and from Allen's work, we now know uh, about where the, the dynamics of, of uh, the importation of enslaved labor. Uh, so we know that about 25% uh, of enslaved people came from uh, Indonesia and the Far East, 25% uh, from India and Sri Lanka, 25% rough numbers, 25% from Madagascar and about 25% from Mozambique. So those were the major uh, regions from which enslaved people arrived in Cape Town. And um, yeah, socially, um, yeah, you can imagine it's, it's, it's not a nice life. Uh, there, were, there were some, um, you know, acts of resistance, of course. Uh, uh, we've there's some writing from uh, uh, from Ward. I forget her first name, uh, but uh, you know she she had some correspondence between uh, in, uh, formerly enslaved people, and I remember reading uh, one one letter uh, about uh, a, a relative who wanted to to get one of her kin out of this, you know, this wretched life. So there was, I know a lot of people would like to say that, well, that's how things were in the past and everybody accepted it, but actually that wasn't the case at all. Enslaved people knew that what was happening to them was wrong and they, they had a desire to, to, to be free. So we see um, uh, acts of, acts of uh, disobedience, for instance, um, uh, tru uh, truancy was a big one. Uh, people just not showing up uh, to, to, to give their labor for free. Um, we see a lot of cross-cultural relationships between Dutch East India Company um, uh, employees and also between enslaved women, for instance. So there was, yeah, it was, it was, it was an uneasy, it was an uneasy relationship that, that, uh, that enslaved and, and slave masters or, yeah, owned, um, I mean, uh, uh, experienced. So, that's that's what I can think of for now. There's plenty more, but yeah, I'm sure. time is of the essence. So, <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of um, slavery in South Africa, and then, for example, slavery in the United States, were the systems very similar, or were they very different from one another? Well, what what you see in in the Indian Ocean is that which of which Cape Town was a part is that um, there, the Dutch East India Company just kind of piggybacked on existing indigenous slave networks. So there was already slavery in, in Madagascar and in Mozambique and India, Sri Lanka and Indonesia. And it, um, what, the Dutch, what the Dutch influence uh, did was to kind of uh, widen the geographic scope and to um, and to yeah increase demand because there was endless demand for for labor especially at the Cape where there was a chronic shortage of of coerced labor um, and in the Indian Ocean I I'm not an expert but I get the idea that whereas the Dutch were very kind of um, uh, maybe 
they weren't as powerful as they would have liked to have been in the Indian Ocean because they had they they interacted with these very strong um, uh, societies uh, and and there were different kinds of well before arriving in in the realm of the Dutch East India Company there were different kinds of coercion and different kinds of enslavement uh, in terms of uh, like uh, debt bondage, uh, which you could work off uh, in terms of, um, you know, just giving yourself up when there was a famine, for instance, you'd give yourself over to somebody and hope that you'd get fed. Uh, disasters, natural disasters would uh, take away people's ability to earn a livelihood. Um, and of course, conflict. And I think in the Atlantic world, um, well, actually a similarity would be that, yeah, once, once people came out of the, the slave systems, the indigenous slave systems, they then were in this, in this new slave system that perhaps was less, uh, less flexible. I don't want to say, I know some people would say, you know, uh, in indigenous networks, uh, slavery was better or whatever. It's not that, it's, it's just, it was different. So, so once you came into, into the realm of these uh, trading companies, you, you know, you, there was no turning back. There was no earning your freedom back. There was no being absorbed into a family structure or things like that. It was very, very rigid. You were chattel and you were there for labor and and also yeah to propagate and um yeah so i think you you went from as an enslaved person you went from uh, a realm of um yeah different kinds of bondage and different possibilities to one where you know there was just you there was just one purpose for you and there was just one path for you Okay. So I guess that's, uh, yeah, that's what I'd say about, about the two. Okay. Um, Kara, do you have a question? I hope I've answered yeah. your question. Um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, this is, sorry. Thank you very much, Linda. This is, this is really um, fascinating research that you're undertaking. Um, we we uh, sort of briefly chatted about um, that you were busy trying to uh, trace where um, sort of enslaved people were coming from. Uh, I was just wondering if, if you could maybe just touch upon that and tell us, um, you know, a little bit about how what that research involves and um, if, if you're having any success there. Um, well, what I I knew that there was going to be limited um, limited information about enslaved people, uh, so I kind of used a dual approach, and one was to look at. Uh, 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 at the uh, human remains of enslaved people. And the other approach was to go into the Dutch East India archive, which is very extensive. And we have part of it in Cape Town. And uh, I also looked in, in The Hague in the, in the Netherlands. And um, so I went, my Dutch was very poor, but I went and I crossed my fingers and I was like, okay, I'm gonna go to the archives. And I'm going to look for lists like ships manifests and, and see if anything, if I find anything. And luckily I, I did. And um, uh, so what, what I'd find were these, um, of course, beautifully written 18th century documents, um, which would state, say, um, uh, uh, a European person traveling with their enslaved, uh, uh, with enslaved people, uh, uh, transport and food paid for until Cape Town. So, and so what, what, what I realized was that, oh, there seems to be, well, there seems to be proof of the fact that there was, um, you know, a kind of private slave trade uh, using the Dutch East India Company's network. 
um, well, it's, yeah, networks. And, uh, and from my research, it looked like it was mostly high-ranking Dutch East India Company officials who, uh, who were using these uh, ships to transport enslaved people to Cape Town where they could fetch uh, quite a high price uh, because, like I said, there was this chronic shortage. And, um, and then I got to Cape Town and I realized that once these enslaved people got off the ship, then that was the final confirmation because I see them being sold at the Cape, uh, same names, same ages, and the price that they fetched. And interestingly, this, this just came out of this uh, research was um, Willem Adrian van der Stel, uh, Simon van der Stel's son was really quite involved. And we know that he traded uh, on his own account um, uh, at the Cape and that got him in trouble because everything the Cape was supposed to benefit the company, but he was doing a little side side business for himself. And it turns out that one of his side businesses was this, this trading in enslaved people. Um, and uh, from the from the skeletal material, I I used isotopic systems to determine um, yeah one whether individuals um, had been born at, at the Cape or whether they had uh, migrated to the Cape, how many times they had migrated, because that would give us an inkling about um, you know how how life was in indigenous slave networks before coming into contact with the Dutch. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we actually see that uh, some individuals had multiple migrations and you know, that's not final proof, but it does give an indication that uh, yeah, people were moving in indigenous networks before they, um, they came in contact with the Dutch. And um, what also came out of the isotopic research, uh, which would require some more, some more uh, evidence, but there's, there seems to be uh, a trend that enslaved men were, um, were, well, they came from a broader geographic region than enslaved women. And that's, yeah, why that would be the case, um, I'm not necessarily sure, uh, but we do know that there were, you know, there were preferences, uh, racial preferences, ethnic preferences for different uh, sectors. So we know that, um, uh, for instance, the for agriculture. Um, that was mostly African, so Madagascan and, and Mozambican okay. enslaved people worked in agriculture. We know that the Malays were uh, sought after because they were, they were thought to be great uh, craftsmen. Uh, so there, there were those, those different preferences. Um, but yeah, that's something that requires, that requires further investigation. But uh, it's um, yeah. I didn't expect to find that, but oh, wow. that uh, that came from the research. Cool. Thank yeah. you. That's, that's amazing. Um, unfortunately, we're about to run out of time, but um, yeah, it's 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 an incredible history. It's it's a hard history, I think. You know, for for people still to this day, for all of us, for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. but thanks for introducing us to it and talking us through your research. It sounds like really amazing work and. You know, one of these sort of wonderful examples of, of finding that voice in our histories, that voices that have been ignored and forgotten and, you know, cast aside. So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it's been really interesting. Um, and hopefully maybe we can have another chat at some point in the future and, and talk about other aspects of your research. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks for having me today. Thank, thank you very much. Thank really you really much. Okay. okay.